For our sermon today, I would like to hold a kind of a conversation with a prominent theologian regarding specifically the idea of miracles, as we have just heard and read in the scriptures of John 2 verses 1 to 11. As a minister, over the years I have heard many different perspectives, impressions, and stances of decisions to either accept by faith, convey inquis inquisitive or skeptical engagement, or express outright refusal or denial regarding the certainty about miracles. All of these stances expressed often by those claiming to be Christians, followers of Jesus, disciples of Christ. Since I am no longer able to invite the person to speak face to face, as it were, because on July 17, 2020, J.I. Packer passed from this life into the arms of Jesus, I am drawing on his written work to inquire of his insights, beliefs, and manner of living as his Christian life. He wrote prominently and comprehensively from his life commitment to study, learn, and teach, but also to live his faith very publicly. Since 1979, he has been a leading professor of theology at Regent College in Vancouver. I never did study under him, but have heard of him and have now read a number of his books. And three years ago, when Reverend Venita Roy visited us from India, I took her to see Regent College. And that afternoon, we met and talked with J.I. Packer for about 30 minutes in the student gathering area Venita was overjoyed to have met him in person. From his book, Concise Theology, A Guide to Historic Christian Beliefs, I want to engage his responses to the idea of miracles. So let's begin. From his book, uh, first of all, I would say, what does scripture have to say about what a miracle is? And what terms are used when referring to miracles in the biblical writings? J.I. Packer writes, Scripture has no single word for miracle. The concept is a blend of thoughts expressed by three terms, wonder, mighty works, and signs. So, if miracle is not the substantive thing we seem to have formed in our conceptual thinking, and when we are honest about it in our personal desire to experience a miracle, especially when we are in a time of turmoil, is it right to think of miracle primarily as the outcome we want to see manifest in our life? the healed limb, the removal of the cancer, or any number of such things. J.I. Packer writes, Wonder is the primary notion. Miracle, from the Latin miraculum, means something that evokes wonder. A miracle is an observed event that triggers awareness of God's presence and power. Striking providences and coincidences and awesome events such as childbirth, no less than works of new creative power, are properly called miracles since they communicate what awareness, this kind of awareness, in this sense at least, but not exclusively, there are miracles today. And then I ask, there are three terms identified by J.I. Packer, so if wonder triggers the awareness of God's presence and power, rather than 
focusing our attention to the physical event as the primary purpose, then what does the mighty work do for our spiritual formation and all and our all too human focus on self? J.I. Packer writes, Mighty works, work of power, focuses on the impression that miracles make and points to the presence in the biblical history of supernatural acts of God involving that power that created the world from nothing. Thus, the raising of the dead to life, which Jesus did three times, not counting his own resurrection, in Luke 7, 11 to 17, the widow of Nain's son, in Luke 8, 9, uh, 49 to 56, Jairus' daughter, and in the Gospel of John, chapter 11, verses 38 to 44, the raising of Lazarus. And Elisha, Elisha, Peter, and Paul did once each. In 1 Kings 17, 17 to 24, 2 Kings 4, 18 to 37, Acts 9, 36 to 41, and 20, 9 to, uh, from verse 9 to verse 12. These are scriptures that I named so that you might look them up and just be thoughtful as you read them. Therefore, as, as I started, the rising of the dead to life is a work of the creative power of God. It cannot be explained in terms of coincidence or of nature taking its course. The same is true of organic healings, of which the Gospels account, uh, recount many. They too exhibit supernatural recreating and restoring. And so I ask again, these miracles even point us, uh, these miracle events point us to the presence of God, using God's power that created the world from nothing to accomplish exactly what the scriptures, God's plan, has already revealed to us. Yet in stories of the scriptures, people ask Jesus for more signs, more spectacle, more unbelievable things to be done in order for them to believe. Do they not even see their own contradiction? The unbelievable things are unbelievable. But if Jesus will do more of these unbelievable things, then they will believe. But they don't, even after they witness with their own eyes. So what good are the signs? J.I. Packer writes, Sign as a label for miracles, the label regularly used in John's Gospel, where seven key miracles are recorded, means that they are that they signify something. In other words, they carry a message. The miracles in Scripture are nearly all clustered in the time of Exodus of Elijah and Elisha, and of Christ and his apostles. First of all, they authenticate the miracle workers themselves as God's representatives and messengers. Again, in the scriptures of Exodus 4, 1-9, 1 Kings 17, verse 24, John chapter 10, verse 38, and chapter 14, verses 11, verse 11, and 2 Corinthians, verse 12, and Hebrews 2, verses 3-4. And they also show forth something of God's power in salvation and judgment. Such is their significance. So, miracles, signs, signify something. They carry messages. Messages that authenticate God's representatives and they reveal God's power regarding sal salvation and judgment. They reveal the truth about God's people, and they show the purpose of God's ultimate goal and power, salvation and judgment. So does the belief in that miracle, signs, mighty works, and wonder 
acting as the agents of the revelation of God's glory, lead us to acknowledge Jesus as Savior and Lord? J.I. Packer writes, Belief in the miraculous is integral to Christianity. Theologians who discard all miracles, thus obliging themselves to deny Jesus' incarnation and resurrection, the two supreme miracles of Scripture, should not claim to be Christians. The claim is not valid. The rejection of miracles by yesterday's scientists sprang not from science, but from the dogma of a universe of absolute uniformity that some scientists brought to their scientific work. There is nothing irrational about believing that God, who made the world, can still intrude creatively into it. Christians should recognize that it is not faith in the biblical miracle and in God's ability to work miracles today, should he so wish, but doubt about these things that is unreasonable. So, in this season of Epiphany, the time of the revealing of God's glory, miracle is purposeful to direct our attention and commitment to God. God made manifest in Jesus Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, who created all things and has promised to love us, provide for us, and equip us to be a blessing to others when we enact grace, hope, peace, joy, and love by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And all we have to do is believe unequivocally and serve sacrificially, and the miracle of God's love will manifest itself to us and through us. Thanks be to God. Amen.